third of our Center for Music Education at Georgia College Professional Development Workshops for the 2023-24 school year. Today we have Mr. Wally Shaw, who was the first band director at Houston County High School in um, Houston County, Georgia. And so he opened the school and established all of the traditions and the music program or the band program in general. So let me tell you about his traditions. He started such a parent organization that is self-sustaining that my husband followed him, what, 24 years later? And the band parent organization is still rolling without any kind of real, over, I mean, there is oversight, but not any kind of real oversight. For example, my husband will be in his office and a band parent will come in and say, isn't it time to rewrap the semi or isn't it time to do this? And so Mr. Shaw was able to start parent organizations that are self-sustaining and that fulfill their needs. And so he's going to teach us to do some of that today. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I. Uh, uh, I have been retired since 2015, so anytime I've, I'm given the opportunity to, to speak, especially at this level, I jump all over it. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be here, and I hope some things that I share with you today uh, will be helpful. Uh, I did want to start out with, with the, the next slide I was going to go to here. I want to preface it uh, uh, with uh, something here, and and I'm thinking that uh, that Tina will, will agree with me on this, uh, that, uh, and you know, I'll read, I, I'm not insulting anybody's intelligence here, but I you know, uh, wanted everyone to know this, graduate student and our undergrad student as well, that you know, the transition from college study to school teaching is a complicated process. Even the best college music education programs cannot compress every experience a young teacher needs into an undergraduate curriculum. There isn't enough time. Some degree of on-the-job training is inevitable. There are many administrative, organizational, public relations, management, and teaching techniques that aspiring band directors, choral directors, elementary teachers, Spanish teachers <laughs> must master in order to be successful. Some of these techniques are learned in the normal course of the on-the-job training, but many of the most important ones aren't. Knowledge of the important and secrets must be offered by capable and dedicated mentors and must be readily accepted by open-minded and dedicated novice directors. Uh, this is a, a preface to a, a textbook, or, or not really a textbook, but a book that I have uh, uh, listed as a resource at the end of this uh, <clears throat> PowerPoint presentation of uh, some things that I think uh, are important and, and might be helpful to some of you. Um, Basically, all this says in the preface is uh, as soon as you get into the business, find a mentor. Um, it's it's incredibly important. There's no way you're going to know everything you need to know. Uh, I have often said to young uh, teachers that once you get your diploma, that gives you permission to teach, not necessarily the ability to know everything you're supposed to know. And that the next four to five years are actually uh, what I call in the instrumental world band director school. And uh, uh, hold on just a second. Julia now. Bo is my my golden retriever is trying to contribute to the uh, to the lecture here today. So I apologize if you hear him in the back commenting. But um, anyway, uh, I cannot stress having a mentor when you get into the teaching business. Uh, even up until year 34, the year I retired, I still had people that I would call or email or text and run things by just to make sure that somebody was along on the same same page as I was with something that I was doing. So anyway, enough about that. You know, find a mentor as quickly as you can when you get into business. Those of you that are grad students, I hope that you've already done that. Uh, you probably have because you just sometimes you need the answer to something that you may not readily know. So. Uh, I cannot stress that enough, but we're going to talk about the, the parent organization today. Um, I know I have some instrumental uh, students here. I have string students. I have some elementary students. My experience is basically with, with, with instrumental band. Uh, so that's the angle I'm going to approach it from. But, you know, that's uh, uh, I think it can be readily, you know, geared to, to any level that uh, uh, that it would serve a purpose. And the first question that is usually asked by a lot of new new teachers 
even some veteran teachers after some bad experiences, do I need or am I required to have a booster organization? And, um, and, and it, it really depends on, on a few factors. And if I've listed here, you know, at three different levels that you might consider uh, the need of, of an organization. Uh, I'm gonna work from uh, the top down. High school, um, I'll be real honest with you, from the administrative side, once a program gets up and going, uh, you're gonna need some help. Uh, there's no way that you can keep up with everything and do it adequately without you know, some things falling through the, through the, the, the cracks in the floor. Uh, there are so many things to consider and we'll talk about those later, but high school, I would most definitely uh, recommend that you have some type of parent organization that, um, that, uh, that would, you would have to help you with uh, the running of your program. You know, everything from the financial to the, the administrative to you know, just uh, uh, several things that we'll discuss later on. Now, moving to middle school, um, I know some middle schools that do have a parent organization. A lot of my good friends that teach at the middle school level, um, they have what they call go-to parents, not necessarily a, a booster organization, but parents they can call if they need help with a fundraiser, parents they can call if they need snacks for an after-school rehearsal, parents they can call if they need help with uh, getting the band from one place to another transportation-wise. Um, so, uh, you know, not so much there uh, as you would say at a high school. Now at the elementary school level, uh, you know, I, I, uh, we were talking earlier right before we started with uh, someone that's at an elementary school and we're talking about, you know, time management with the, with the, uh, with the, the lesson they were gonna teach. And uh, a good friend of mine to get back in the county here in Houston County went from an administrative job to teaching elementary music. His first time ever teaching elementary music with 20 years of experience. First, uh, first class he had was a group of kindergartners. They came in and he said, all right, everybody sit in a circle. Of course, they were kindergartners. They didn't know how to sit in a circle. <laughs> and he said, it went downhill from there. <laughs> and so uh, I, I can certainly relate. Uh, there are, you know, there, there are many aspects to running an elementary program. There's not as much, there is some, but a limited amount of after school uh, things that would have to be handled financially uh, with or with transportation or anything like that. Uh, several classes have room moms. That used to be a thing. I don't know if it still is anymore, you know, uh, that would help with, uh, with, with transitions, with stuff like that. Um, so I, you know, I. I would not think that there would need to be a booster organization. I do know uh, 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 in the past, uh, uh, an elementary music choral uh, program that the uh, teacher had a booster organization, but they were real big into musicals with the elementary music program. And he had a, he had a very structured uh, parent organization to help with building props and, and, and after school rehearsals and stuff like that. Now, that's the exception. That's not really the norm, you know? So uh, uh, any, if I, was going to, if I were going to pursue something like that, I would probably, yes, I would, I would have some type of structured organization of parents so they could reach out and help. So anyway, that being said that, you know, the need uh, uh, is assessed by, you know, I would think the level that you're at and, and, and the extent of what you're gonna do with your program. But uh, all of these, regardless of where you have a booster organization at any of these three levels, you're gonna have to do one thing and you're gonna have to do it well. And that is, you're gonna have to work with parents. And, um, and I will be real honest with you, even after 34 years of teaching, I related much better to my students than I did to adults. Even though at that point I was somewhat 20 years older than a lot of my parents, it was much easier for me to talk and interact with students than it was with adults. I, I, I have no idea why. Um, two of the other resources that I'm gonna use in our, our talk today deal with two folks uh, that have written books uh, that um, 
I think are important. Uh, Mark Worth, uh, he calls it the line in the sand. And, uh, and, and basically what that means is uh, that there needs to be, with working with parents, there needs to be uh, a, a spot that, you know, where the director is responsible for all musical and performance related activities and decisions. Uh, and the boosters basically provide moral or uh, logistical and financial support. Now, in the real world, that runs smoothly like a well-oiled machine. Uh, I would say that probably 80% of the time it does not. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Another, um, another uh, I used the Mark Worth book when I taught uh, marching band techniques at Columbus State. And uh, there was a, uh, for those of you that are, that are high school band directors, uh, it's a, it, I would say that's a must purchase book. It's a, it's a very good book for uh, anyone that runs a marching organization. It's very structured and it was very helpful. Uh, the other uh, philosophy is by a guy named Scott Rush. Um, I first met Scott when he was the band director at Wando High School in South Carolina. And uh, uh, I met Scott on the, uh, on the marching competition field where he cleaned my clock numerous times with a BOA band. Uh, he, and I, you know, I said, I need to get to know this guy. <laughs> you know, uh, I need to know what he's doing and how he does it. And lo and behold, Scott writes a book, you know, and, it, and his philosophy is the band director handles the music and the band issues and the boosters handle the booster issues. And uh, as uh, Dr. Holmes Davis said earlier, a parent would come in to her husband Jay's office and said, isn't it time to put a new wrap on the, on the trailer? That is definitely a booster issue. And they just wanted a nod from the director, you know, but they're not going to come in and say, I just really don't like the way the first number in your marching show is going. That, you know, stay in your lane. What's that commercial that came on? You know, so uh, anyway, so that's basically what Scott's saying here is, you know, uh, you know, there should be some trust issues here, you know, when you do this. Now, let's say that uh, you're walking into a new, uh, a new situation. I have some grad students here that think back to your first uh, day, you know, where you were affiliated with your, your first job and you had to meet that first parent, you know, you don't know who that first parent is. They just show up in your band room or in the parking lot, or they've called and want to meet with you. Uh, and, um, and they want to discuss the band program with you. And all I'm going to say here is just be careful with the first parent you meet. Uh, they may want to be helpful. They may have an ax to grind. You just, uh, you, you, you hear them out, see what direction they're headed. And uh, I, I've seen situations where I've talked to colleagues that said, I had a parent that came in that wanted to be very, very helpful and wanted to help with this. And then I realized it's because they wanted their child to be drum major, you know? And, uh, and so, you know, be, be very neutral in any, uh, in any first initial conversations that you have. I mean, I've even had those issues as well as where, you know, uh, if, if, uh, you know, a parent would come in and, uh, you know, and they're on the executive board and we'll talk about that later. Uh, and, uh, well, you know, I'm just using an arbitrary name here. Susie wants to be drum major. And if she's not drum major, she's just not going to march this year. And I'm thinking, well, you know, you've already made my decision for me. You know, <laughs> that's a, thank you for letting me know before we go through the entire process, but discernment, be very careful. Don't make any comments that can be used against you later, you know, uh, and uh, and be very careful uh, when you're working with parents like that. You will know eventually what parents you can confide in and other parents that you just need to keep that that healthy space. And then lastly, uh, working with parents, there is what I call the age gap. When uh, I first started teaching back in the Stone Age, you know, you go in as a brand new teacher, you've just graduated with your undergrad degree. And, you know, for, in reality, you're only four to five years, most of us, four to five years older than the seniors in your program if you're at a high school. So you have parents that are going to look at you as a kid, understandably, and they're going to treat you like a kid. I've known several instances where it was very difficult for a young band director to get anything done 
because the parents overrode everything they did because they thought, well, they just don't know, you know, and uh, that may be partially right, but it goes back to that line in the sand too, where even as a young director, you may have to stand up and say, look, you know, this is what you do. This is what I do. So, you know, that age gap can, you know, it could certainly be tough initially going out. Some of you grad, uh, graduate students that are already in the business, you may agree with me on that. You know, uh, some of you may say, nope, that's never happened to me, you know, but uh, the age gap, it changes. Uh, I say it changes with gray hair. Uh, by, the, you know, by the time I retired, I was everybody's grandfather. You know, I didn't have to really float anything by anybody. You know, it was just Mr. Shaw said we need to do this, so let's do this. And uh, and that you know, and and that certainly helps. But um, but that's uh, that's something that you really want to consider as you go through. And you know, don't take offense if you're treated like a child when you first get in the business, because uh, you basically are going to have to prove yourself. And uh, and there's several things that that uh, you can do to help with that. And one of them is being very organized with what you do. You know, don't be scattered, smothered and covered in my famous Waffle House terms, you know, but, uh, but you know, that's, uh, that's something to consider. But uh, let's, uh, let's go on and uh, let's say you're walking into your, your first job or into a new setting uh, and, and you're working with what's already is uh, what I call a, uh, 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 I would have considered uh, a first time in a in a in a job. I'm sorry, I just lost concentration. Somebody popped a question up, so uh, I stopped to read and I lost my train of thought. Does that need to come back up right quick, or is that question? Who who submitted it? Somebody said they were a late bloomer. Yeah, I'm monitoring it. So if something needs to be addressed, I will. I'll pull it out. Okay, but... all right. You just stop me uh, if I need to. But anyway. Uh, so let's say you go in, you, you've been hired, you've signed your contract. Uh, you know, certainly you want to meet with the students. That's the most important thing, you know. Uh, and if you can do that before the school is out that, uh, that year and it's, and it's uh, agreeable with whoever is leaving. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, you may want to have a conversation with whoever's leaving to, to ask about the parent organization, you know. And once again, be neutral, you know. Um, we don't know why this person's leaving. It, it may be for a, a better position. It may be they've been asked to leave. It may be unhappy parents because of the way things have been run. So, you know, just, you know, just store it away so that you can go back and review it. But as soon as you get everything, get your feet on the ground, I would arrange an initial meeting with the executive board or nominating committee as early as possible to discuss the organization that you are inheriting. Um, and when I say executive board, uh, these uh, books that I recommended break this stuff down, but executive board's usually the the, the booster officers. Uh, just to give you a, a quick, I say the big four, president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. Uh, that's usually uh, the, the, the big four of an executive board. There may be others that are on executive board, but they are, uh, those are the ones that you want to, you know, initially meet with if you can. And, and if that's kind of in, in an array, check and see if there's a nominating committee in place that it's about to select. Depending on when you take the job, they may not have selected officers for the next year. So uh, you may get the luxury of actually being able to help with that process. And one of the first things you want uh, to, to address is, uh, does the group... Uh, have a working set of bylaws that are being followed. No, oh, bylaws, where do I get bylaws? Well, there are two ways to go about that. You can sit down and do the tedious process of writing all those out or with, with the parents, or you can do like I did when I started the one at how, the Boost Organization at Houston County High. You just borrow somebody's and, and borrow somebody's and borrow somebody's, look through them all and say, okay, this looks like one I'd like to use, you know, and, uh, and, the one of the reasons that you want to look through this set of bylaws is because you're at the end of the school year getting ready to start your new job and you want to know who's coming on board with the committee or with the executive board who's leaving the executive board uh, and it'll help answer questions you know do I have a treasurer that's been treasurer for the last 12 years which is not good uh, you know uh, 
do you have a child on the band? Oh no, they graduated years ago. You know, that's, that's not a good mix, but you know, these are things that you need to see, you know, what are, what are the procedures for electing, you know, what's the length of time they can serve, you know, things like that. And, uh, and so that will help you organize and get at least wrap your head around how things are running with that group. And then uh, while you're talking with this group, you want to try to get an assessment of what appears to be working with the, with the uh, booster organization and what needs to be addressed. Uh, one of the age old uh, adives with most booster organizations, and this applies to anything, uh, you know, 10% uh, of the members do 100% of the work. That can be booster organizations, that can be churches, that can be uh, the workplace, you know, uh, where you're teaching, you know, 10% of the, the, the membership does 100% of the work. Uh, so that might be the first gripe that you get from the, from the group that you meet with is we can't get people to help, you know, well, in what area, you know, is it concessions? Uh, is it uh, with uh, uniforms? Is it with, uh, uh, chaperones for events, things like that. So what you want to do is try to assess what's working that you really don't have to address and then what needs to be addressed, you know, and then, you know, that's, uh, that these are some areas that, you know, will certainly, uh, that, that, I mean, they'll rear their ugly head uh, immediately, you know, because some of these things you're going to have to have running as soon as you hit the ground, you know, uh, concessions, uniforms, chaperones, you know, there are other, there are other things too. We won't get too deep into the commitment of parents, but you know, these are things that, you know, I got to get kids fitted in uniforms. Our first game's a home game. We have the visitors concessions. Who's in charge of concessions? You know, uh, 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 our, our first, our first game is away. Do we have a way to, that we select chaperones? You know, a lot of things there that you, uh, that the questions that need to be asked and uh, so that you can go ahead and get started on that. And then, you know, if you're overwhelmed by all this, you know, once again, you know, mentors, uh, good books that how to books, like I've mentioned earlier. So these are things that, uh, that um, you might want to do as soon as you get involved. Uh, any of you uh, uh, veteran teachers that are in there, uh, uh, have you experienced any of these issues? I'll, I'll open the floor here if that's okay, uh, Doc, if uh, anybody wants to comment. All right, nobody's had any problems with their booster organization. That is fantastic. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> I think Queen Esther put in the chat that she's rebuilding, yeah? Ah, okay, all right, yeah. I, and uh, and what I'm, I'm going to go to the next slide and rebuilding is sort of like creating a new boost organization. So uh, yeah, uh, uh, so uh, let's 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 I'm going to go to that next slide and let's talk about that creating a new boost organization. So as I mentioned earlier, bylaws and a mission statement and how do I develop these? Well, you know, unless you want to spend a month typing all this stuff out because it can get rather long. You know, uh, I would you know. I would look for some, you know, I, I brought, um, um, I brought a set with me from my previous teaching, uh, uh, position. Uh, I, uh, I borrowed some, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Alfred Watkins was at Laster high school for many years. Uh, and Alfred, let me see your bylaws. You know, he said, well, they're on our website, just go download them. And, you know, you can go to a lot of, of, uh, organizational, uh, websites and they'll have a copy of their bylaws and their band handbook on there and that uh, and that is an incredible resource that you need to use uh, so I would look for those first and then you know uh, I would you know look for finding uh, uh, a group of parents that might be willing to serve as your executive board now I'm not going to say God didn't have a hand in my transition to Houston County High School, but when I first came up uh, at that time, the feeder uh, the feeder schools for our high school was very scattered. At that time, there were five middle schools in Houston County, one of Robbins and Perry, and I and I got kids from all five middle schools. So in the spring, when we were trying to crank everything up, I was going to five middle school parent meetings, trying to figure out who my kids were 
uh, the parents weren't real sure because they the, the zones were real sketchy. They weren't sure if they were there. Uh, uh, one of my first parent meetings was held in um, in a house that when they drew the lines, it was it was hilarious. Uh, uh, the last name was Davidson, and uh, and Miss Miss Davidson said, "You want to know something hilarious?" I said, "What?" She said, "If you look on the map, the line for the the Houston County High School school zone goes right through the middle of our house. So if you're standing in the kitchen, you go to Houston County High School. If you're in our living room, you go to Warner Robins High School. So you know, uh, so you know, we 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 had some interesting things like that, but." I was, yeah, I was, yeah, I'm not gonna say I was freaking out. I was very concerned of, you know, how am I gonna create this organization? I don't know anyone. And then lo and behold, uh, out of the blue, I get a phone call. Now this is back when cell phones were, I mean, I had a bag phone in the car. That was where cell phones were at that time in 91. You know, it was, it was real early, but I got a call on my home phone down in South Georgia where I was living. And it was a dad that just had a lot of questions, you know, and they were good questions. You know, what do you think we should do about this? Which I said, you know, I said, uh, Bill, do you want to be my president? <laughs> and he said, well, gosh, I'd never thought about it. I said, well, Bill, I need help. And you seem to ask all the right questions. So uh, unless anybody else opposes that and we don't have anybody to not uh, that would oppose it. I, why don't you at least be my my advisor right now, you know, in this method. So uh, so we started with that. And then the first thing he did said, well, we need to get together with parents of all the zones. So let's get the word out. And, uh, and it, at that time, it was tough. You know, uh, there, you know, the Internet was in its infancy, if it was even a thing. So you just couldn't put something out there, you know, on the Internet, say, hey, we're going to have a meeting. It all had to be done by sending hard copy papers home with kids to their parents, you know, uh, you know, on the, you know, on the on the mimeograph machine. You've seen where everybody picks it up and smells it. You know, you, those of you who remember that you can smell it right now as I'm talking about it, you know, but uh, but anyway, um, so we had our first meeting, you know, we had a ton of stuff we had to discuss, you know, uh, the, the, the the executive board positions, committee positions, job descriptions, things like, like that. And we basically plugged it into a set of bylaws that we already had in place. And um, and I said, and, and at that time we did, we, we, we broke the bylaws by the fact that we really didn't have elections. We just kind of sat around the room and said, all right, who would be interested in doing this? Somebody would raise their hand and we'd say, everybody okay with that? And they went, yeah. I said, okay, as we get bigger, we need to get better, but let's let's go with that right now, you know? And uh, so, you know, you're dealing with a lot of stuff that I had, you know, when I took this job, I was probably around 34 years old, which I was not a baby, but I was still, I'd never created a program from scratch before. So there were a lot of things that I was just unaware of that I was going to have to take care of, you know? uniforms, new equipment, music, you know, color guard tryouts, you know, uh, uh, and, st and stuff like that. But but one of the first things we all agreed upon was we're going to have to have money to do anything that we do. And so we need to get somebody that would be a pretty good treasurer. Lo, lo and behold, one of my moms was an accountant. So that that helped immensely, you know. Reluctantly, she took the job because, you know, this was in the spring when we were meeting and it was tax season. And, you know, I'm pretty busy right now, but well, we won't put too much on you. But if we you, we need to get a checking account started, we need to do this. We need to do that. So at that point, we had uh, we didn't discuss uh, item three there, the financial considerations of uh 501c3 and things like that, because we weren't really aware that that was a thing at that time. But um, as you get in and you're starting a Buddhist organization or you have one already in place, the question may come up about 501c3. Now, that's basically a nonprofit tax exempt organization. Do you want that status? And uh, if you are going to do that, and I I think a lot of a lot of organizations do uh, understand that there are a lot of responsibilities that come with that. You have to register with the state. You have to register with the federal government. Uh, you'll start anybody that works with your program, whether it's part time or whatever. You're going to have to do W nines and W twos. Uh, you got to keep up with all financial transactions. 
And my first question is, why are we doing this? Well, we get a tax, we get a tax break. Okay, well, that's good. Where do we need a tax break? Uh, most music stores and uh, music publishing companies, they don't assess taxes to school organizations. Uh, the only time that we really got a tax break is when we went to Sam's Club to buy stuff for the concession stand. So weigh it out in your set, you know, do I need all this in order to get tax break on sodas and hamburger patties at Sam's? You know, uh, you know, and, and you know, how much, you know, how much time do I want to put into that? And think about this as well. If you go with the flow of most bylaws, you're going to have elections, people roll off of your executive board every two years. So technically, you'd be changing treasures every two years. So you're going to have to start from scratch every time you do that. So, you know, I'm not telling you that 501c3 is bad. I'm just telling you that you got to really be strong and organized if you're going to do it correctly. So uh, uh, think about that. And then, um, and so uh, the next uh, the next thing I would talk about is your organizing is are my committees and there are some incredibly important committees and everybody's gonna say oh yeah I bet it's uniforms I bet it's this I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna step out and say uh, 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 the the first committee you need to establish is a PR committee somebody that's responsible for selling your program to the public somebody that gets the word out because if you're busy trying to get a band rehearsed, get kids on the field as it is at this time of the year with marching band uh, or if you're just trying to get the beginner started you know if you're trying to get kids scheduled into your choirs by by virtue of their experience their level of, of experience uh you know uh if somebody can get out there and and get information to parents get information to the public can uh, keep the lines of communications open with your program. I would suggest that that's probably one of the most important committees that you get started first. You know, somebody that can help field the emails and things like that so that you're not getting an email about, you know, hey, what time does my child need to report for blah, blah, blah. You know, uh, if you get it on the Facebook page, the Remind app or, uh, or, you know, the website or email or anything like that that you're using, uh, that, uh, that parent or that committee can be just the most valuable organization that you could have. Um, that, uh, that would be what I would do first. Um, <clears throat> probably the next committee would probably be Ways and Means. Um, Mr. Shaw, before we go yeah. on, can we back up? Because, yeah. um, I think some examples and you help me here because I'm just looking from the outside um, are, you know, you've had specific email for uniforms, things like that. So those emails don't go to the band director that goes to the uniform committee or. Right. Exactly. And if you've got someone in PR position, they can forward it to that to that spot. Now, I will I say that to say this. If you've got if you have good people in place, they will take care of that for you. But that doesn't mean that you don't need to be aware of what's going on. Sure. Okay, <laughs> you you need to you know. Okay, yes, uh, Susie uh, didn't know what time to report for uh, for you know for uh, call time for the for the Christmas concert. Did I not get the word out there? Is there something I need to improve on there? I need to talk to my PR committee and say, hey, did we drop the ball here? Or you know, stay actively involved. You know, but still yes have somebody that gets that communication going make sure that that the questions get sent to the right people exactly i watch on jay's facebook page all the time people asking questions before jay can even respond boom some parent is already you know and it's in a good positive way i'm thinking well they must be in charge of this because they they responded to that question and got them headed in the right direction so that's that's an incredibly important uh, aspect of your of your organization uh, did, did that help okay all right let's move on to ways and means uh, there are other committees that are important ways and means I'm going to next simply because your program for whatever reason is going to need money you know whether you're buying music 
Uh, let's face it, most school budgets are uh, probably not going to be very adequate for what you need. It's the nature of the beast that so we can sit here and gripe about it. But, you know, in reality, it's, it is what it is. I will tell you the, 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 the challenges that you face today have always been there. Um, especially if you're in a large school system where, you know, the, the, the pot has to be spread out amongst a lot of folks. Uh, but Ways and Means Committee, basically, they're the ones that raise the money. They're the ones that come up with ideas on how to fundraise. They're the ones that help you with the fundraisers. Uh, and and, and they, uh, once the budget's in place, they're the ones that take a working budget and they they run with it you know okay that we can do this we can do this we can do this and uh and you want a ways and means committee that's very creative because you can only sell so much cookie dough and cheesecake you know there have got to be other methods out there of of, of raising money and there are you know you just got to be creative uh uh doc does uh does jay still sell the onions in the spring um, they have, yes, they, they okay. typically, they have parents that ask, are you selling onions yet? I need to order my okay. onions. <laughs> Brings a tear to my eye, literally, you know, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, just to give you a, a quick example of a fundraiser that, that a parent came up with, uh, came to me and said, uh, and this was probably about 10 years before I retired, said, we need to sell Vidalia onions. And I'm going, why would I sell Vidalia onions? Uh, they said, ah, people will buy them, you know? And I'm going, really? And so I said, well, I need a contact. And this person says, I know a guy. And uh, so uh, his name was Tommy Butler. He worked out at the base in Warner Robins, but he owned a little farm over in uh, in Empire, Georgia. If you, if you don't know where Empire, Georgia is, it's not really a place. It's a state of mind. But anyway, it's uh, but uh, but it's over in Dodge County. Uh, and, uh, and you say, well, it's not Vidalia. Well, Vidalia Onion, since I grew up right next to Vidalia, it, the soil type constitutes whether or not an onion can be classified as a Vidalia onion. But anyway, he grew onions. And the first year we bought onions from him, you know, we did okay. And by the time I retired in 2015, his entire crop was sold by the House and County High School Band Program. My last year there, we sold 12,000 pounds of Vidalia onions, which that's, uh, that's six tons <laughs> of onions. <laughs> and, uh, and it's just like anything else, you know, you go to a bank again, and we start like uh, you said, Doc, if people start calling, hey, are we doing onions? You know, I've got people asking, you know, 10 pound bag of onions, 10 bucks. Tommy made five, we made five. If you can't find another fundraiser where you can do 50% profit, I challenge you to look for it because they're hard to find. And um, and so, and, and it is a perishable product, but it lasts a lot longer than oranges and grapefruit. So uh, anyway, and 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 so and it helped a local guy but anyway so you know uh ways and means yeah i got off on fundraising i apologize but you know you're going to be looking for stuff like that and once again we talked about the mentors earlier ask your friends hey what's been a good fundraising project for you you know does this work you know because you're going to get once you get your first teaching job and some of you can, uh, if you haven't already, you're going to, somebody's going to be knocking on your door from some company saying they've got the surefire uh, fundraising uh, project that's going to earn you a gazillion dollars. And you don't have to do anything. And both of those are lies. Okay. So <laughs> you're going to end up, you're going to end up counting sausage and cheese and you're going to, and you're not going to make <laughs> but about 40% profit if that much. And, uh, and so anyway, that's something to think about. But uh, so we did ways and means, of course, probably uh, the next committee that you would uh, want to uh, organize is probably going to be uniforms. Uh, you got to keep got to get the kids dressed. And uniforms we could talk about for a long time. Um, and Doc, I haven't talked to Jay about this, but those uniforms are getting kind of old. Are they having any type of discussion at uh, at Hoco about new ones? I'm sorry, that's not my circus, so I don't know. Okay, all right. <laughs> I thought he would come home complaining about how much they cost now, but anyway, I just what? I just had that com I just had that conversation with a young band director over on the west side of the state, asking me, "Gosh, what do I do? We're a small county." 
we don't have a lot of money and there are a lot of options out there, but yeah, you know, that's an ongoing thing. Either, if you're not buying uniforms, you're trying to keep the ones you have up to date, sewn, buttons on, everything like that. You've got to have an army of parents to keep that going. You know, uh, you may have dry clean only uniform jackets and you live in a small community that doesn't have a dry cleaner. You know, what do we do? You know, uh, so these are things that you have to take care of, you know, when, when you do that. So uniform committee, uh, getting that organized. And then, um, and then I would say probably after that, um, concessions, if you have concessions. Now this, uh, this is, uh, it, it, it depends on where you are. It's still whether or not you're going to have this animal to deal with. Um, at Houston County High School, we have concessions on both sides of the field unless we're playing an in-town rival and then they get to run the concession stand on their side of the field. But if you're playing an away, if you're playing a, an away team, uh, you know, you're you're uh, going to at house and you have both sides. So you're talking about huge manpower. You're talking about buying and stocking. You're talking about dealing with the Coca-Cola company, which is a nightmare. <laughs> and uh, you're talking about somebody can grill hamburgers and hot dogs. You're talking about somebody's got to go get ice, you know, uh, uh, these types of things. So it's something huge. And and you've got to you've got to find somebody that doesn't mind doing that. I, you know, I look back, uh, uh, Dr. Davis, at uh, at uh, Amber Strong when she was uh, she was incredible. She she came on right as I was retiring and did a fantastic job for Jay while she was there, you know, and uh, so it, uh, it concessions is incredibly important because that's going to be one of your big fundraisers at uh, any given time. You can probably bring in uh, Jay was excited from their first home game against Sumter that uh, they sold out of everything and cleared. I can't remember. It was, it was, it was five digits. I want to say between, you know, 10 and 15 grand, maybe I'm not sure, you know, at the, at the first game, you know, uh, and that's incredible. Um, because I'm going to tell you when I was at Hoco and we first started up, there were a lot of one and nine, two and eight football seasons. There are not a lot of people in the stands <laughs> when, when you're having football seasons like that. And, uh, but now I'm sure it was a packed house at that first ball game. And, uh, and, uh, I'd be interested to know what happened at the Perry Hoco game last night. I bet they did well. Perry did anyway. But you've got to find people that can um, that can uh, help with that. So those are your big committees. Now you run into a lot of other committees. Uh, transportation. Uh, the first game we went to uh, as as a band in 1991 at Housing County High School, we used a little box truck, little like it looked like one of the little U-hauls, you know, that had a truck front on it. And we, we carried all our equipment in that, and I didn't have a driver. So I had to put chaperones on the bus of students, and I had to drive the truck. Uh, and uh, we grew, and as we grew, we went from that to U-Hauls and rider trucks to using the big delivery trucks that the, band, uh, that the uh, Board of Education had to now, if you go past Houston County High School, there's a semi sitting out front. Uh, because the band is the point that it, it takes that plus two other pull behind trailers to get them from point A to point B. And it, it just grew to that. So transportation is a huge issue. Uh, you've got to have moms and dads. Uh, as a matter of fact, it became, by the time I retired, it became a cult at, uh, at, uh, at my school. I, didn't, I think it probably still is. Uh, they had their own t-shirts uh, and uh, they had a certain way that they loaded. Uh, a parent couldn't just walk up and want to help. I'm sorry. Who are you? You know, uh, uh, you need to go help with the chaperones. We've got this, you know, uh, and, and, and when we'd get the last thing up, it was so nice that the equipment would leave out ahead of us. We would pull in at the Mac, which is the downtown stadium. We'd get out. All the instruments were out in their cases in a row. All the drums were sitting out waiting. All the kids had to do was step off the bus, pick up their horn and line up, you know, they prided themselves in doing this, you know, and it developed over so many years. And then once we got everything to the stadium and inside the gate, the head transportation guy would come up and say, are we done now for a while? And I said, yeah, 
say, all right, great. And I would look over there, they're dragging the big gas grill off the back of the semi and they're setting up their kitchen and they're out there cooking next to the, they had their own, they had their own uh, uh, little, you know, uh, place out there that, uh, that they were, uh, they had, they were cooking, you know, and I'd, I'd get a call on the radio, uh, Mr. Saul, we need you at the equipment truck. And I'd go out there and they'd hand me a steak. You know? <laughs> They said, just take this back with you. I said, there's no way I'm going to walk back in front of my kids with a steak on a plate. No, <laughs> cut it in half. I'll eat some of it on my way back in, but I am not going to do that. But they would have their own, uh, uh, you know, pregame festivities. But, you know, that's the way that got. And and it's still working now. You know, I've wa- I've gone by and, and watched them load. And, and I went by the other day. We're doing a remodel here at my house. And I had some lumber left over. And I, I called Jay and I said, hey, is your uh, props guy? He said, well, props guy may need it, but we're building a new ramp on the semi. They need lumber. I said, okay, I'm bringing it out. And so, you know, uh, so yes, that is a huge committee that uh, it, to get the band from point A to point B. Um, I didn't always have that. I remember a kid named Eddie Carter back when we were using uh, the, the BOE's uh, uh, delivery truck. And Eddie was the only one that knew how to fit. He was one of my students. He was the only one that knew how to fit everything on the truck. It had to go in a certain way. This had to go in and nobody moved till Eddie called for it on the truck. You know, Eddie got sick and couldn't make a game one Friday night. And we loaded and unloaded that truck four times when we got everything to fit because Eddie wasn't there. And I think somebody actually called Eddie on the phone and said, hey, what goes on next? We can't get it to fit, you know. So having somebody that can take care of that, because that was a nightmare of a night, because we couldn't leave the school to go to the game until we got everything on the truck. And it was very frustrating. So that's an important one, too. Um, And then uh, props committee. Props were not that big of a thing when I was teaching. They're a huge thing now for those of you in marching band, you know. they spend more money on props than, than, than I can ever imagine back when I was going. And, uh, and I remember Jay had that big, uh, Pandora's box. Was that last year? I believe. Oh my gosh. You know, that was, his, that was it was huge. You know, uh, you know, go on their website and look at it. Most of the, sorry, most of the upgrades to the, the semi for this year and most of the props for this year are them pulling that down and repurposing all of that material. Yeah, you know, I uh, I wasn't sure that, you know, it, that it was as big as a Habitat for Humanity house. I'm not like, it was huge, you know. But anyway, so uh, if I were to stress one other thing, when you have your booster meetings, I would have a hospitality committee. How do you get people to come to a church function? You have food. I'll guarantee you, if, if parents know there's going to be pretty good snacks at the booster meeting, they're going to show up. Uh, we've got the district, uh, the district meeting. If you know, and uh, coming up uh, Monday night. And if any of you are in the area, if you're grad students and you're in the area, or if you're an undergrad, you know, uh, doc, doc, tell them about it. It's going to be at Veterans. You just show up. There's going to be food, <laughs> you know, and 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 they'll meet and you'll get uh, District 11. Yes, uh, at that uh, it's going to be at Veterans High School. And I think that that you know, it's always Chick Fil A is catered in, Zaxby's. Uh, all kind of goodies, cookies and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, I always try to get there early so I can get it while it's hot, you know, (laughs) but, uh, but anyway, so the, uh, you know, a hospitality and then there are plenty of others, but I'll give you some resources so that you can look now developing the climate that we've just discussed. You've got to do that. You've got to have an on the ball nominated committee. And I think, uh, Scott rush, uh, uh, highlighted this in his book, The uh, Successful Habits, uh, like-minded with the director that think like you. And uh, and I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I've had fantastic bo- booster organizations and I've had years that it was not so good. You know, uh, I've had years that I got to April, I had not had the spring banquet and had to order awards and everything. And there was $200 in the checking account. And I needed 1500 to 2000 just to order senior plaques and stuff like that. So I had to go out and do a fundraiser just to do that. You know, so you want like-minded people that are willing to work. 
don't mind asking people to serve, you know, and get those people on your nomination committee. And there needs to be an understanding once they do this. And this sounds kind of petty, but it's something to consider. Tell your whoever's ahead of your nominating committee, I need to see the list when you get done. And they'll come to you and say, hey, here's our list. Do you think you can work with these people? Uh, I mean, that, you know, that's kind of a snooty thing to say, but yes, you're going to have to work with these people, you know, and, uh, and, and so that's, a, uh, that's important. So how do you find these people? Well, one of the things that is suggested is something that I did as well is you have to use a parent profile form. And uh, this is, uh, uh, Doc, I'll get this, a copy of this to you. I wasn't sure if I was breaking copyright laws by copying that, but it's in the Rush book. And it's also in the, uh, in, in, in the other book as well. Uh, and basically what you do is you send it out to parents and let them check the box next to their interests. So that heads you in that direction, you know? Yeah, I, I would be interested in being uh, a, 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 the nurse on a band trip because I'm an RN. Yes, I could help, and yeah, you know, yes, I could help with uh, with props because I, I I own a cabinet shop. You know, uh, you know, yeah, I want to be on transportation because uh, you know I, I work at the Ford dealership. You know, uh, yeah, you know, my last treasurer before I retired was the bookkeeper for Ford dealership just south of here. She dealt with hundreds of thousands of dollars. She certainly could be a pretty good treasurer, you know. So uh, these these forms help a lot uh, gearing where you're, uh, you know, how you can find out who is, uh, uh, would work well with, with your group. Uh, and, and, and one of the things I want to stop and do right now when you're doing this and and, and I, let me run back up to the PR aspect uh, for just a moment. Um, I am watching, you know, a transition from the way I used to do things to almost totally relying on technology now to get word out to everybody. You know, Facebook, Remind, emails, uh, uh, things like that. But yet still, there are things that, fall through the cracks that don't get taken care of. Uh, when I was when I was leaving the business, Facebook was not really, well, it was becoming a thing, but it was not really a thing. Remind was not a thing. Uh, it had, had not yet been created. Uh, the only real way we had to communicate was email. Now, think now, how many of you actively, well, if you, if you, uh, if you talk to your professor, you're probably doing email, but if you talk to one another, you text. You know, there are methods out there. There are methods out there to, uh, to, to, to do that where you can use text. I think Remind uh, is the one that comes to mind because it goes straight to the phone. But if you're relying on email and you're looking at your e email list and somebody's got AOL.com or Hotmail or something, like, chances are they're probably not checking their email. One of the things that we did in the spring, and this is so old fashioned, but it made sure that it got in everybody's hands. We mailed hard copies of all the forms to everybody's house. We didn't rely on electronic anything. We made sure that it came in their box to the parents of, and it was a folder with intent forms, parent forms, stuff like that. And also included in there was a self-addressed stamped envelope to come back to us. All they had to do was check, sign, stick it in the envelope and, and stick it in the mail. They didn't have to go find a stamp. We, we sent everybody back and it worked wonderfully, you know? So old fashioned stuff does work. But anyway, those are the ways you can do that. So I've got one last thing. I've only got a few seconds left. So the song that came out with the OJ, I think it was the OJs back during my time, y'all, I man, it was called Money. Money, 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 money. Anyway, it uh, that is going, you know, they're looking at me with these blank stares. They don't know this song so you, you, <laughs> so, oh, you do okay thank you uh but anyway you have your treasure one of the most important things you can do with your treasure is have them bonded this is not a distrust thing it's just a safety bonding your treasure if anything happens to the money nobody nobody is going to lose money i sat at gmea state convention one year talking to a dear friend of mine he was down in the dumps. I said, what's wrong? Well, we raised $50,000 for uniforms. The treasurer took off of the money. Last we heard, they were in the Bahamas. Their money was gone. 
You know, so bond your treasure. Set a budget. There are several ways. All you got to do is Google band budget, you know, or choir budget, or, and we'll give you some great examples. Are you going to assess fees? And you need to see if that is allowed in your school system. Some school systems will not let you assess fees. You just have to fundraise, fundraise, fundraise. And that goes back to ways and means. Uh, they're the ones that are going to help that. But get a budget, stick with it, you know, and, uh, and know that there's never enough money to run your program. You just got to prioritize and do what's important. And the fees, you know, uh, fees have gotten out of hand, in my opinion. But, you know, with what it costs to do things in Houston County, you have to pay bus drivers. If you got a good successful football year, that could be in excess of $20,000 for buses. You know, uh, you know, it's just, it's crazy. But anyway, th those are some things. Now, one of the last things here, here, here are the resources that I use. Um, uh, the, the Scott Rush book, he's written several books. If you're an instrumental person, I would strongly suggest this book. If you need some help with marching band, you know, uh, Georgia College State University's marching band is not huge. When I went to Valdosta State as an undergrad, there was no marching band. So anything I did, I had to do from watching others, reading and things like that. Uh, Mark Worth does some incredible stuff. And then the last one here, Band Director Foundations for Success. Uh, this is a book that when I was teaching, any student that ever student taught with me was required to read this book first before I would allow them on the podium. Uh, and uh, it was written by uh, Bill Miller. He's actually been in my band room. Uh, he was in uh, he was uh, he was in down in Florida, in Lakeland, Florida, and uh, he was actually in Henry Fillmore's band at the University of Miami, and and Fillmore was actually in his band room when he was teaching, and the book is incredible. All the how tos from putting a horn on a face to organizing to getting your band to sound better to running a program. It was edited by Alan Clark, who used to be the commander of the band, the Air Force Reserve here in um, in Warner Robins, dear friend of mine. Uh, he uh, retired and is now uh, with Robert W. Smith over at Troy doing the uh, uh, the music industry major over there. So. Uh, these are very, very good books. There are a lot of others out there too that have great ideas. And you've always got to do that. So how'd I do, Doc? 12.59 on my clock. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Shaw. Thank you for this. And those of you who are not banned, you can, a lot of times you can take these things and just turn them around easily for your use. Absolutely, I hope they're applicable to, to both. Uh, if yeah. they need my email address, feel free to give it to them if they have questions and they want to email me. I, I would love to serve as a mentor to any of you as you're getting into the business. Uh, that is a responsibility of anyone that has retired. That's their job, is to help the new folks and the folks that are still in the business. All right, thank you so much, and thank you for coming. Um, All right. Wonderful Saturday.